July 24, Potsdam, Germany, American President Harry Truman nonchalantly strolls around a conference table and leans in to where Soviet leader Joseph Men of Steel Stalin is sitting. Truman whispers in Stalin's ear, we have a new weapon of unusual destructive force. Stalin feigns composure and tells Truman, I hope you make good use of it against the Japanese. Inside, Stalin is absolutely seething. He's been rattled to his bones. How did they do it so fast? He asks himself over and over again. Even so, he plans to catch up with the US regarding atomic bomb development. The US doesn't know much about these plans, and it has misjudged the Soviet Union's progress regarding creating earth-shattering nukes. It will soon be Truman, who Stalin calls a noisy shopkeeper, who's filled with shock and horror. But why did Stalin feel so upset? Hadn't the US and the Soviets along with the other allies just beaten the Axis powers in Europe? With Japan soon to follow in Asia, weren't the US and the Soviets supposed to be on the same team? Time magazine had just discussed how great Stalin was when it made him the man of the year. In 1944, when the World War was raging, the US Joint Chiefs of Staff were already planning for a new war. It was rightly believed that once this war was over, the two most powerful nations on Earth would be the Soviet Union and the United States. The balance of power in the world had shifted. The once mighty Great Britain was now a shadow of itself. It was now broke Britain. And Germany was, of course, done as a world power for the time being, as was France. US intelligence issued a report stating that when the war ended, the Soviets would have around 4 million armed troops consisting of 113 divisions, plus another 84 divisions in satellite countries. The US had deployed millions of its own troops during the war, about 3 million in the European theater, but by the middle of 1946, facing pressure from the US populace and various politicians, much of the US military was demobilized. In June, the army was down to 1,434,000 personnel. The Navy had 983,000 personnel, and the Marine Corps was down to 155,000. U.S. intelligence knew that Stalin would also demobilize much of his military. The Soviet Union was in no state for another war, not yet. It had to be rebuilt. Still, the Soviets had become a regional hegemon, which, despite the seeming reality of the U.S. and Soviets being on good terms at war's end, meant that the U.S. had to plan for the possibility of a new war. Stalin also feared his country would be attacked. The Americans and the British were heartily approving of Stalin's ambitions to spread communism. On August 30, 1945, Major General Loris Norstad sent a document to Major General Leslie Groves that outlined 15 key Soviet cities to be hit with U.S. atomic weapons, including Moscow. It was Groves who had directed the U.S.'s Manhattan Project. He was the one who shrouded the project in secrecy. He had known that a German and Japanese defeat wouldn't mean the end of tensions. Tensions were just beginning. So he tried his best to ensure information about the atomic bomb didn't get out. But as you'll later see, he wasn't so successful on that point. Norstad's report noted that to win a war with the Soviets, they'd have to hit another 25 leading Soviet cities, including Leningrad. Groves and Norstad reckoned 66 Soviet cities could be destroyed with 204 atomic bombs, which would destroy the Soviet Union's aluminum production, as well as 95% of its aircraft, 97% of its tanks, and 95% of its oil refining ability. As reports have since said, their plan was to bomb the Soviets back to the Stone Age. The British Prime Minister Winston Churchill, a man who would both criticize the Soviets and extol their heart to fight, also had a plan, an offensive one. In 1945, he ordered the British Armed Forces Joint Planning Staff to develop a new strategy related to an attack against the Soviets. In the UK's Operation Unthinkable, the objective was to impose upon Russia the will of the United States and the British Empire. This was top secret. It didn't even come out until 1988. In an assessment signed by the Chief of Army Staff on the 9th of June 1945, it was written that the attack was not feasible saying it would be beyond our power to win a quick but limited success, and we would be committed to a protracted war against heavy odds. It's believed that this got back to Stalin, probably through British spies, which is possibly why he told his soldiers in Poland to regroup and be ready. There was also a defensive plan by the British that asked what measures would be required to ensure the security of the British Isles in the event of war with Russia in the near future. Neither the US nor the UK trusted Stalin. While the world sang songs about victory and peace, these nations were planning for war. Then in 1945, Truman issued his giant atomic bluff. Under planned totality, 20 Soviet cities would be hit with 20 or 30 atomic bombs. The US made sure this plan leaked. It would give Stalin something to consider if he also had war in mind. 
but indeed it was a lie, fake news, that Truman hoped Stalin would buy into. The US didn't even have any atomic bombs ready. All the fissile uranium US had was used in the bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and in 1945, the US only had enough plutonium to build one nuke. But it wouldn't hurt if Stalin thought the US was ready. Even so, both Churchill and Truman planned for a real atomic attack when the time was right. It seems Churchill didn't have any qualms about killing possibly millions of Russian civilians. In a conversation with the virulently anti-commie US Senator Stiles Bridges, Churchill said that if an atomic bomb could be dropped on the Kremlin wiping it out, it would be a very easy problem to handle the balance of Russia, which would be without direction. It was estimated that if the US did launch a volley of nukes at Russia's leading cities, 85% of the industrial targets would be obliterated, and 6.7 million Russians, mostly civilians, would become casualties. 2.7 million Russians were expected to die. It would take just a few years to build bombs and the planes to get it done. The American Air Force General Curtis LeMay wrote in his SAC Emergency War Plan in March 1949 that blasting the Soviets with 133 atomic bombs on 70 cities over 30 days would finish them. He called it killing a nation. This was a preemptive plan, not a defensive one. As you'll see later, LeMay wouldn't be very happy about how things turned out in the end. So this was the state of play at the end of the war. It wasn't pleasant, but real politic never is. The British and Americans believed the Soviets could easily overrun a broken Europe. This giant regional hegemon with a massive army and an impressive military industrial complex, and a leader who wanted his country to be the center of worldwide communism, had to be brought down a peg or two. If millions of Russian civilians had to die, so be it. In 1949, the numbers changed again. Under Operation Dropshot, the US said it would need 300 atomic bombs and another 20,000 tons of conventional bombs, destroying 200 industrial targets and 100 urban centers, including the most populous cities, Moscow and Leningrad. Part of this plan was also a land invasion, along with the US's European allies to achieve what the documents say was complete victory. It would probably have been a massacre. And since the Soviets were apparently many years away from making their own atomic bombs, they would not have been able to launch any kind of massive attack themselves. After all, its industrial centers would have been destroyed, its cities would have been in ruins. But what the US and UK didn't plan on is that Stalin had some tricks of his own up his sleeves. He had a whole bag of them, even if he was genuinely upset about the US getting there so early with its atomic bomb. But Stalin also had made some mistakes in regard to making that bomb. To his undying discredit, from 1936 to 1938, he'd instigated what became known as the Great Purge. This was mainly to cement his power over the Communist Party and eliminate anyone who was allied with his enemy, Leon Trotsky. Somewhere between 700,000 and 1 million people were murdered, including many scientists he could have used to help make the atomic bomb. To give an example, in 1931, a delegation of Soviet physicists went to London for the Second International Congress of the History of Science. By 1938, six of those men had been executed, and one had died in prison. The physicist Boris Hessen impressed in London when he presented his paper, The Socioeconomic Roots of Newton's Principia. Hessen's paper was partly a refutation of Albert Einstein's work, which the Soviets banned and called bourgeois science. On December 20, 1936, Hessen was shot by a firing squad after being falsely accused of terrorism. Some of those Soviet scientists were forced to work not with facts, but were compelled to make their science fit Stalin's ideology. Many of them ended up in the Gulag, while others, such as pioneering physicist Leb Shubnikov, were executed on charges of treason that were entirely fabricated. This was one reason why Stalin was so far behind in certain areas of scientific progress. The Soviets did still have many amazing scientists, though, ones that often complained they had holes in their shoes and not enough food to feed their families. Conditions were awful for them, but some scientists' lives improved considerably when Stalin got wind of the Manhattan Project in 1942. Prior to this, Stalin had taken some of his best physicists away from work on uranium chain reactions to the more pressing matters of conventional weapons to help in the fight against the Germans. The physicist Igor Kurchatov had been doing just that, studying chain reactions when he was told to work on technology to protect ships from magnetic mines. Outstanding physicist Yakov Zeldovich was in the same boat, as was the equally outstanding physicist Yuli Kariton. These two men had been taken off their research in uranium chain reactions and told to develop chemical explosives. They might have stayed on those programs had it not been for another brilliant physicist, Gregory Fleurov. In 1940, Fleurov and another physicist discovered something called spontaneous fission. 
Even so, Flerov was taken off of his physics research, and then in 1941 he decided to visit a university library to see how fission work was going abroad. He found a bunch of English-language physics journals and quickly noticed something strange. There was nothing about fission in them, which was at the time the biggest thing in physics. He put two and two together and realized correctly that foreign governments were classifying their nuclear fission research. Flerov wrote to Kurchatov and said that he should get back on his chain reaction research ASAP. Florov then wrote to Sergei Kaftanov, who was the head of the State Defense Committee, about a possible atomic bomb being developed in the West. It's almost certain it was Florov who told Stalin that the Soviets needed to get off their butts because the Westerners were without a doubt moving forward with their project to build a bomb based on nuclear energy. This happened in Russia eight years after the Hungarian-born physicist Leo Szilard had first seen the atomic bomb in his mind while walking in London. It was two years since Otto Frisch and Rudolf Perls worked out the critical mass for the atomic bomb, which showed the bomb could be small enough to drop from a plane. One thing led to another and soon the Americans had a collection of the world's best scientists working on the precursor to the Manhattan Project. Flarov was right, the Soviets were behind, far behind. Flarov then sketched what he thought an atomic bomb would look like and showed it to two of the Soviet Union's leading physicists, Abram Yofa and Peter Kapitza who before the war had worked with some of the best physicists in the world. Kapitza had spent more than 10 years of his life working at Cavendish Laboratory at the University of Cambridge, where Britain's leading atomic bomb research would be undertaken. Even so, when they saw Flerov's sketch of the bomb, they were somewhat skeptical. They said even if it were to work, they'd need uranium they didn't have. The Soviets, they said, would not have an atomic bomb for at least a decade. That's also what the Americans thought. But the Soviets knew a lot more when a German theoretical physicist named Klaus Fuchs, who was working on Britain's bomb project, the Tube Alloys Project, told them what was happening in England. Fuchs's calculations were a significant part of the British project, and so when the Manhattan Project swallowed up Tube Alloys, Fuchs was one of the main players and his spying was a massive benefit for the Soviets. They asked to pay Fuchs, and biographers say that when he was presented with an envelope containing $1,500, a lot of money back then, he pushed it away like it was an unclean thing and refused to accept payment. As for why he was spying, there are two theories. One is that he was simply a hardcore communist, a true believer. The second theory is that he was worried that one country having all the power would lead to that country becoming too powerful, able to engage in nuclear blackmail and perhaps a bit of nuclear bullying. He was right about the bullying. After Fuchs's arrest in 1950, he stated, knowledge of atomic research should not be the private property of any one country but should be shared with the rest of the world for the benefit of mankind. What he meant was that if more countries had the bombs, none of them would be able to use them out of fear of reprisal. There were other spies too. John Karen Cross was part of the so-called Cambridge Five, five hyper-privileged upper-crust men at Cambridge University in Britain who were ironically communists. Karen Cross, as secretary to the chairman of Britain's Scientific Advisory Committee, had access to a high-level report in the autumn of 1941 that discussed the feasibility of a uranium bomb, and he too confirmed to Stalin what was going down in Britain. Now that Stalin knew some of the details of the bomb, the race was on. In 1943, just as the siege of Leningrad was beginning to wane, Russian scientists managed to sneak out a cyclotron, a type of particle accelerator, from the city's Radium Institute. They moved it to Moscow's Laboratory No. 2, where Kurchatov was now heading the atomic bomb project. What they were short of was uranium, but uranium they got when the Red Army later fought their way over the German border. They also had plenty of slaves to mine the stuff. Stalin never had any scruples about working men to death. When the Allies crossed into Germany, the Soviets had the same idea in mind as the Americans and the British. They all wanted to take the best scientists' equipment and documents related to the atomic bomb and other important scientific research. At the time, all sides thought the Germans were well ahead in atomic research, but the truth is they were not. Hitler had never really gotten around to consolidating all his best scientists' work, but the Germans did have something that was useful for the Soviets. The Soviets had sent 40 of their best scientists from Laboratory No. 2 into Germany, and they soon found around 340 kilograms of metallic uranium. The team got to Berlin on May 3, 1945, and whisked up a number of German scientists, including the nuclear physicist Nicholas Riehl. They took Riehl and his family and later even his entire German lab to Russia, and eventually Riehl and many other top German scientists would work at the Soviet's uranium production plant number 12. The story goes that Flerov had asked Riehl to just pop over to Moscow for a few days 
but a few days became a few weeks and then months and then eventually became 10 years. Real was a captive, but he lived like a king just as long as he helped refine uranium. When the Soviets reached the famed Kaiser Wilhelm Institute, they found a hundred tons of uranium oxide hidden among barrels of lead in a tanning plant. The Soviets now had enough uranium to power a nuclear pile to sustain a chain reaction. So the Soviets had useful German scientists. They had spies working in the upper echelons of the American project. They now had piles of uranium. They also had their own brilliant physicists. But what they didn't have was a bomb ready when Truman went up to Stalin in 1945 and told him the bad news. When that happened, according to Stalin's Minister of Internal Affairs, Sergei Kruglov, that was the first time during the war that he lost control of himself. What he perceived was the collapse of his dream of expansion of socialist revolution throughout all of Europe. That's when he put the atomic bomb development into overdrive, with Real and his German colleagues soon making astounding progress. By the end of the summer of 1946, the Soviets were producing three tons of uranium ore every week delivered to laboratory number two. Real would win prizes. He was even given a dacha or cottage in the woods. He was a superstar in Stalin's eyes. Meanwhile, some of the best physicists in the country were now working at the All-Russian Scientific Research Institute of Experimental Physics, which was then the highly classified laboratory known as KB-11 with the whole project being even bigger than the Manhattan Project had been. Once the Soviets saw what happened when the Americans dropped their bombs on Japan, Stalin threw everything at atomic research. He even told his atomic teams they needn't bother with seminars, something few scientists had been allowed to skip out on before. Stalin told Kurchatov that he didn't ask enough from him. All that mattered was progress on the bomb. He said, if the baby doesn't cry, the mother doesn't know what he needs. He told Kurchatov that whatever he asked for, he would get. Keep in mind that this was during the Great Famine of 1946 and 1947, which killed perhaps one million people. The man overseeing the project on the political side was the ruthless sadist of Stalin's inner circle and the head of the secret police, Lavrenti Beria. After Stalin told his top physicists to ask for anything they wanted, he told Beria, leave them in peace. We can always shoot them later. And that was no joke. Yuli Karitan, who was mentioned before, was in charge of designing the actual weapon. Speaking of Beria, Karitan said he understood the necessary scope and dynamics of research. This man, who was the personification of evil to modern Russian history, also possessed the great energy and capacity to work. He was to the Soviets what General Groves was to the US, while Kurchatov was the Oppenheimer. Beria oversaw the work at KB-11, which involved hundreds of thousands of workers, perhaps even as many as 500,000 compared to the Manhattan Project's 130,000. These people worked on various projects, from the building of houses to putting together the weapon itself. Many of them were laborers sent from the gulags. One time, they rebelled after working under such oppressive circumstances only to be shot down in a mass of bloody bodies. This kind of oppression is brutal, but it is another major reason why the Soviets were able to progress so quickly. It turns out the fear of being shot is a great motivator. The Soviets can also take tens of thousands of prisoners and force them to mine, build, and work in the processing plants, which gave them another huge boost to their speed. The Soviets had uranium mines in Russia, Bulgaria, Poland, Germany, and Czechoslovakia. The CIA estimated that around 10,000 technically qualified people worked on the project, including engineers, research scientists, geologists, and laboratory technicians. They were, of course, still aided by atomic spies some of whom were now working with the Americans to build a large stockpile of nukes to possibly lay waste to Russia. The ongoing nuclear espionage conducted by the Americans, British, and the Canadians helped the Soviet effort considerably. They would have gotten there in the end, but nowhere nearly as fast. Still, Beria never knew if there were double agents passing on misinformation and relied on his threats to keep them honest. According to interviews, he once told high-level spies who presented their new material, if this is disinformation, I'll put you all in the cellar. By the summer of 1949, as the Americans were still planning a possible attack on the Soviet Union, the Americans had built 250 nuclear weapons. This was very impressive, but then, on the 29th of August, 1949, at 7 a.m., at the Semipalatinsk test site in northeast Kazakhstan, the Soviets tested their first nuke, which the Americans codenamed Joe-1, after Stalin. In terms of explosive power, it was similar to the Fat Man bomb dropped on Nagasaki. Barry was there to watch the show since he was so untrustful of scientists that he had to confirm with his own eyes that it was real. It took 30 seconds for the shockwave to reach him, and he gazed on with a sense of pride and awe as a white fireball moved upward. 
changing color as it did so. The blast wave took out everything in its path and a mushroom cloud rose out about five miles into the sky. Beria tried to call Stalin, but Stalin was fast asleep. Beria told Stalin's secretary, it's urgent, wake him up. Minutes later, a grumpy Stalin picked up the phone and said, what do you want? Why are you calling? Beria replied, everything went all right. Stalin then rejoined with a slight tone of menace in his voice, I know already. Beria subsequently slammed down the phone, screaming at the men around him, who told him? Who told him? He threatened, even here you spy on me. I'll grind you to dust. Beria was rightly concerned about Stalin keeping eyes on him. The boss was more paranoid than ever, and he'd even sent members of his own family to the gulags. He was constantly testing the loyalty of everyone around him. He even held parties at his house just to see who didn't laugh or laughed hysterically at his bad jokes. No one, even in his inner sanctum, was safe. So now the Soviets had the bomb, but this bomb was in the hands of a man fast losing his sanity. On September 23, 1949, Truman announced, we have evidence that within recent weeks an atomic explosion occurred in the USSR. The monopoly on the atomic age was over. It had been very short-lived, and the Soviets would soon develop the more powerful hydrogen bomb too thanks to Mr. Fuchs. No one was blowing anyone to smithereens anymore, or at least not without significant blowback. It's worth pointing out that had the Americans had considered trying to bomb the Soviets prior to making their own nuke, the plan was for the bombs to be delivered by B-29 bombers. But it would have been very difficult to get them to their targets while avoiding Soviet fighter planes. On October 4, 1948, a Senate Armed Services Committee was told, the unpleasant fact remains that the Navy has honest and sincere misgivings as to the ability of the Air Force to successfully deliver the atomic weapon by means of unescorted missions flown by present-day bombers deep into enemy territory in the face of strong Soviet air defenses and to drop it on targets whose locations are not accurately known. They knew where the main urban centers were, of course, but not where the main industrial targets and secret weapons plants were. Six years after Joe won, the Soviets tested RDS-37 with a yield of 1.6 megatons, almost 100 times more powerful than Joe won. The US then feared the Soviets wouldn't just match them for bombs, they'd outpace them. If there'd been an opportunity to strike in the past, it was now gone. Plenty within the military machine still said strike now and strike fast. But as the Soviet stockpile grew and they created the biggest nuclear weapons in history, it seemed like madness, or mad, mutually assured destruction. In the 1950s, the previously mentioned American Air Force General Curtis LeMay believed that the only sure nuclear defense was offense, that is a preemptive first strike. LeMay always regretted not hitting the Soviets when they had the chance in the 1940s. He later said, native analysts might look sadly back from the future on that period when we had the atomic bomb and the Russians didn't, or when the Russians had acquired through connivance and treachery of Westerners with warped minds the atomic bomb, and yet still didn't have any stockpile of weapons. That was the era when we might have destroyed Russia completely and not even skinned our elbows doing it. He was probably right, but surely the world's a better place for it not happening. Now you need to watch least safe countries if World War III breaks out or have a look at real reason why Nazi officers fled to Argentina after World War II.